You know, if I go out, if I'm the good guy, which is rare because that's not that just doesn't work for me. But if I'm the good guy and and we're we're wrestling and the audience is telling us that they want the other guy to be the good guy and they don't like me. I can choose to ignore that and just do what I want and do what I think is uh, maybe even best for me, going to put me over big. Or I can listen to the audience and give them what they want. And that's that's how I've always done things. Some people with a big ego just want to get their uh, get their stuff in all of their big moves and make, you know, make themselves look good. But I just really wanted to make sure the audience leaves happy that they leave having had the time that they expected. And if that means that in the process, they're going to hate me. Cool. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a treat for you tonight. It's Lincoln Murphy and Lincoln, you are the first professional wrestler that I've had on the podcast in 300 episodes. So <laughs> welcome to the show. And this is going to be a lot of fun. Oh man, thanks for having me. That's a, that's a distinction. That's an honor. Yeah. First well, wrestler. it's also a failing on my part, given how much catch wrestling and shoot wrestling have influenced modern MMA and how, I, I guess, I guess you can make an argument that Eric Paulson, one of my coaches who has been on the podcast is a shoot wrestler, is a catch wrestler, not a pro wrestler. So uh, now we're beginning to slice hairs and hopefully by the end of this podcast, all these distinctions will make some kind of sense. Uh, for sure. For sure. So, can you just tell us a little bit about your background in wrestling? So what got you into, you know, hugging men and trying to grind them into dust on the ground? Yeah, well, the, the first ones I saw were on TV. So those guys were glistening also, right? Rippling muscles. Uh, what what you know, was your era of catch of uh, pro wrestling? Yeah, so early, uh, early 80s. So WWF, uh, very cartoony, very um, over the top you know, muscular superhero kind of thing. The interesting thing was I, w I grew up in Alaska and the only thing we got up there was WWF on TV. There was no local wrestling scene. Uh, WWF came up there one time that I remember. Um, and, but I would read the, the wrestling magazines. Mm. Uh, these were, this was before the internet, obviously. And, and this was at a time when everything was, was kayfabe. It, keep it on the down low. Every, you know, we're gonna we're gonna promote this as if it's uh, as, mm -hmm. as if it's real. What we would call a shoot. And so I was reading these these magazines, and they had a lot of um, smaller organizations, things that are happening outside of the WWF, things that I didn't know about. And I just really kind of fell in love with all of it. You know, I'm not going to be an apologist for for loving Hulk Hogan. Like that was cool. You know, that was that was the those are the the kind of cartoon characters that I grew up with. But I, I just loved it for some reason. And then my great grandfather took me to my first show, live show in Louisiana when I was 10. And I was I was just blown away and, and hooked on this thing. OK, then how do you make the transition from being a kid growing up in Alaska to actually getting your chops in to learn how to, you know, do the moves that Hulk Hogan was doing? Not that he did that exactly. many moves, probably a bad example. I think he had three or four, three or four good. Hey, you don't need a lot of holes, mm. right? If you can do three or four things, great. There you go. And Hulk Hogan had that down. Yeah. I mean, you know, look, I, I loved wrestling. The, I had, to me, the, it was this, this universe that didn't exist any, in any way in an, uh, in an attainable place for me. And so I sought out like something that resembled it. And I ended up, uh, we moved to Oregon, I ended up at, at a place called Medford judo Academy, uh, not in Medford and not judo. <laughs> Uh, it was, it, it, at least it wasn't the judo that I thought it was going to be. Uh, it was, it was very much ground fighting kind of what we would look at as jujitsu today. It was, it was Japanese in, uh, in, in origin, but you know, it was, uh, it was on the ground stuff. Mm -hmm. I loved it. It was great, but I moved around a lot. So I moved away from there. Then I, I ended up at, in mill in, in, mil in uh, middle school, um, where there was a wrestling team. So I joined it. And it was nothing like the jujitsu or whatever I, you know, at the time I've, I've sort of gone back and said, I think that was jujitsu. Uh, whatever that was at the time was cool because you could hurt people. You know, you can you could make them give up. Uh, you couldn't you weren't supposed to do that in this wrestling. And it wasn't the the bouncing around the ring like I thought it was going to be. So I got out of that and I kind of you know, hindsight wish I hadn't. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that would have been a pretty good foundation. But, uh, you know, and then just over the years, I wanted to there were, there were different wrestling schools and things that I, I heard about. Hart Brothers up in Calgary mm. uh, was one I wanted to go to. We couldn't afford it. One time my mom met uh, a pro wrestler. I think he came into the gym that she was working in. He said he could train me. Uh, sounded like a scam. It, it most likely was. Uh, it would have taken the money and run. We'll get into more about that because that's pro wrestling. That's like that's pro wrestling. Um, and and then eventually I ended up through what we would call my, my shoot job, my real job, uh, ended up in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And a friend said, hey, do you want to go to a wrestling match uh, at a bowling alley? And I said, obviously, yes. <laughs> and so we went there and it turned out they had a wrestling school and it was like twenty five dollars a week. Uh, their, their actual shows made money. So they didn't have to work the, you know, train these, these wannabes for $3,000 gimmick. They, they actually made money. And so they wanted new talent, 25 bucks a week. I did that. And the rest is history. Okay. So what does going to pro wrestling school look like? It was, uh, primarily bumping. So that's, that's when you fall. That's what we call falling. A bump is Here's anything. How to take where a you, pile driver. Yeah, basically, right? And and right out of the gate. Uh, in fact, they want to break you. Can you can you take it? I don't remember how many people started with us. Maybe ten. Uh, there was only three of us that finished the, uh, the 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 training, and one guy really wasn't able to to wrestle after that. I mean, he graduated, but uh, he had a hard time because the ring uh, is not a not a trampoline. It's it's wood over over metal. Some have a spring in the middle, but those are actually the harder ones. Most rings are going to be just kind of cross beams with some uh, two by tens or something over over that with with a little bit of padding. You can't. The misconception is that it's a trampoline. It's not. The other misconception is that there's a ton of padding. You can't have a ton of padding and be able to, to move. Mm. So it's a fine line. But, yeah, I mean, uh, you go in, you take bumps um, in you various ways moves or just how to fall mostly learn how to fall. Um, and then they say you've been, you you can fall pretty good. And the other guys don't think you're, you're super dangerous. Uh, you graduate. And, uh, which is why the very first match I ever, I ever had, uh, I guess I had actually developed kind of an attitude problem. Um, I don't remember that, but it may, it, it seems likely. And, uh, the promoter didn't, didn't like me. I mean, I graduated, but, uh, he, he really didn't like me. So the first match I had, he told the other guy uh, to hurt me. So that's fun. Welcome to pro wrestling. Uh, you say, well, wait, so are you guys not really trying to hurt each other? Not really. I don't know if that's a secret. Uh, you know, I, I don't say anything is fake ever. Uh, at least I try not to ever say that word because it's super dangerous. Lots of risk. Lots of pain. Uh, it's why I can't move in, in certain directions now. Um, but, you know, it's it's a cooperation. Um, and right out of the gate, this guy was supposed to not cooperate with me. And that was a fun welcome to the to the business. Now, How did he during not the cooperate match, with you? Uh, well, I apply some sort of shoot hold to me um, versus a show hold that we might do in front of the audience. Uh, you know, to apply something that was that was intended to injure me hmm. i don't know what that was going to be uh but somewhere during the match i earned his respect and he didn't he didn't do it okay but that was uh that was like that was my intro to the pro wrestling um you know they try to break you and then they try to intimidate you and ultimately they're trying to chase people out of the business because it still goes back to that 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 those carny days uh of of catch wrestling and taking on all comers and all and things like that um work in the circus you know, and, and don't trust anybody. And so pro wrestling now, 20 years later, uh, is much more accepting of outsiders, but that was still kind of a transitional period between, you know, the, the real, the days of not, not even letting you know that it's worked if you were going through training and then, um, you know, versus now where it's, it's all out in the open. Um, and, They'll take on. They'll take anybody, and they welcome you. It's like in it's, the schools are run like businesses and stuff. This was that middle ground where it was still kind of an outlaw thing, and um, you know, you 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 come in, you get beat up, you pay your dues. Well, the distinction between fake and real is an interesting one. Uh, it really yeah. de- comes down to semantics. I mean, if fake means prearranged, that, well, that's a go. very different meaning from fake meaning, you know, 
you, this isn't dangerous and you're not going to get injured. I bet the average pro wrestler is more injured than the average MMA guy. And that's saying a lot or more injured than the average jiu-jitsu guy, or maybe even yes. more injured than the average freestyle wrestling. All of which is saying a lot because none of those guys are walking around without injuries. Right. And if it, it, the, I would say, yes, I, I would say that pro wrestlers are more injured. Uh, and somehow I feel like this is, this is uh, bragging, you know, or <laughs> we're trying to, it's a, it's a weird uh, pissing contest, yeah. but, but pro wrestlers, I would say are more injured. It, it Maybe a more accurate to say, a more accurate thing to say would be they're differently injured. Mm. Um, the, the, when you fall, you know, we call it, we have something to kind of call it jokingly, but it's, it's, it's kind of serious. You have a bump card. There's only a certain number of bumps you can take before you, you got to stop. Hmm. Uh, some guys have, have a high number. Some guys don't. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's like that, you know, when you take a, when you, when you take a fall, um, it just jars everything. Hmm. And so I would say differently injured, but uh, I think that is finally what drove me out of judo. It wasn't the lifting while twisting while, you know, while spinning, it was the falling and the better I break felt, the better I break felled or break falled, the worse my back and hips became, the more, uh, I spread it out over the whole body, the wor- then you start doing really dumb things like, you know, not trying to break fall and like trying to land on your elbow on the side of your head because <laughs> you know, it's going to hurt less than doing the nice slap. And also from a competitive point of view, if you throw me and the, the ref isn't really sure whether to give that an epon, which would mean that you win. Or a wasari, which means I still have a choice. You know, if I do a nice break fall, I've just told the ref, man, like, this is an epon. This is a good, this is a good score. Right. Whereas if right. I kind of, you know, curl into a ball and kind of pummel into the ground and, and limp away, maybe they're not going to call that an epon. Interesting. Yeah. So it's think of, think of that, uh, that break fall where you're, you're, you're almost selling the move. Mm hmm. So that your your opponent thinks that they did a great job, and the referee says, "Oh, that was amazing." That's kind of what you're doing in pro wrestling. Only you're trying to do it even bigger, right? right. So you yeah. know, when you learn to fall in pro wrestling, you're not learning to. <laughs> this is the misconception. You're not learning to prote- protect yourself. You're learning to make it look like you fell <laughs> much bigger. <laughs> so it's a lot of people try to sell. Oh, we know how, it's a weird thing. Like they want to sell that it's not that dangerous, and we we know how to fall. Yeah, you know how to fall. But you are encouraged to make it way worse than it has to be. Yeah, and the other you're being you're falling from the top of the the corner, <laughs> you know, the turnbuckle through a table. <laughs> well, yeah, then then there's there's all of that, uh, which is in, just even more insanity. But uh, even just right there in the middle of the ring, a real simple thing, a body slam, guy picks you up, uh, a simple fall like that, you can't, you know, there's a number of those that you can take. So. so how did you get involved in more of the catch wrestling, shoot wrestling uh, aspect of the game as opposed to the call it, standard American WWF era pro wrestling? Yeah, so what I what I say is I was trained in Southern style wrestling, which was very much uh, just bumping into each other and <laughs> knocking each other down. Um, not, you know, maybe some throws like a body slam or, or a, a suplex, but that's it. You know, no, no, no real ground based, you know, anything that would even come close to being legitimate. Uh, I didn't learn that. So again, the very first match I had, I, my opponent was told to hurt me. My thought after cool, he didn't cause I earned his respect or something during the match. And he, he realized that I, I wasn't this egotistical little kid that, that the promoter said I was, um, what if he had tried what if he had tried to shoot on me? What was I going to do about it? And again, in the moment, I didn't even think about that. And, and even afterwards, just sort of looking back on it, uh, I remember, I, here's the thing I don't remember. There was a match that I was in, not that long after starting. And the guy that I was, I was wrestling was a really huge muscular guy and, and quite a bit taller than me. And he, he threw me into the ropes, which is a, a wrestling trope that, that I, I don't really – like anymore because it's just one of those things that totally exposes wrestling for being ridiculous you throw somebody and they come back at you but um you know he went to throw a clothesline which generally speaking you're going to take that across the chest um so it's it's not gonna it's not gonna knock your head off it's just gonna knock you down but he didn't throw it 
like a normal clothesline. He kind of threw a shoulder right into me, hit me right in the jaw. And I went down. And as far as I remembered, uh, that was the end of the match. And then I was at the hospital. Mm. Uh, it turns out, after watching the tape, uh, we wrestled for at least another five minutes. <laughs> but what happened was I, he, knocked, right, he knocked me out or down. And I, I rolled out of the ring. And you can see this. I kind of I kind of come to her or whatever and I'm I'm pissed. I'm mad at this guy. So I jump back in the ring and I go after him like I'm going to fight him. And then you see me stop. I didn't know how to fight. I didn't know yeah. what to do. And you know, sh- was that the appropriate reaction considering it might have been an accident? Probably not, but you could it was just an interesting thing. We don't always get to see ourselves make that decision. And and you know, uh later on when I when I was at the hospital, uh, the pain was, was there. I just remember thinking again, what could I have done? And that, that, that started me thinking about that. And then later on, um, a little bit later, maybe six months or so, uh, after I started not that long, I started coming down to Dallas, which is where I'm at, uh, from Tulsa every Friday to wrestle, uh, for NWA Southwest. And, uh, you know, I was just what we call a curtain jerker. I, I was the first match, uh, you know, on, on the card, not, not really, you know, just going out doing some real basic stuff, but I saw Dan Severn was there and so then I saw pre UFC. This, no, this would have been after UFC. Dan Severn's always oh, sorry, back you said 99. Forth. Yeah. 99. Oh, okay. So, um, he, yeah, he, he, he would always have his UFC titles, but he, at the time had just, he, he had been the NWA national wrestling Alliance world champion. He lost it to this guy, Ogawa in, in Japan. Well, it turns out, uh, right about, you know, I saw Dan Severn and then I saw this other guy come in really tall Japanese guy with an entourage, uh, of photographers and, and just seconds. And there he was, he had the NWA world title. They were going to fight that night. It was something that wasn't advertised. I think the travel just, it ended up working out. And so I did my match, got dressed. Uh, and then, you know, generally speaking, wrestlers don't go out and watch other wrestlers, uh, have their match, but I watched Dan Severn and, and this guy warming up like as if they were athletes, you know, and I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Um, and they go out to the ring and everybody, all the wrestlers go out, kind of hang back, but we all watch the match. And I remember asking the, the guy that was standing next to me, who was a veteran, he'd been around for a while. I'm like, this is weird. Is this, is this a shoot? Cause they were, they were wrestling, uh, for real. They were, uh, what it looked, you know, looked real to me. Mm-hmm. They were applying submission holds. Um, then there were some elements of pro wrestling. Uh, you know, they rolled out of the ring at one point, which I kind of was like, okay. Uh, and they kept fighting on the floor. Um, <laughs> I was like, okay, I've seen that in MMA fights. Uh, it's true. It can happen. Uh, <laughs> so, but yeah, the guy was like, it's, it's kind of a shoot. And I was mm. like, okay, kind of a shoot. What does that mean? Well, it means it was what we would call a shoot style match, um, which is a style of pro wrestling from Japan. Um, it was the precursor to MMA in Japan. We can get into that more, but it was amazing. It was this entertaining match that was very much based on on ground fighting and, and submissions and i was just i was taken with that and so i started looking up things uh i got into tape trading so i could get tapes of of early mma stuff and 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 shoot shoot style matches from japan um there were All a lot of, of organizations. That era. exactly right right and uh i was just blown away I'm like this is cool this is uh this is still entertaining you know, if it's a 20 minute fight, you know, you're going to get 20 minutes of action. But the ending uh, was prearranged there. Yes. It wasn't. Yeah, it was still, it was still pro wrestling. Um, let me see on that one. I think it was a tie. It right. was a draw. It was a draw. Uh, cause it was sort of, you know, it wasn't something planned. And so you really didn't want to probably put one guy over the other one, uh, in that scenario. But for the, for the local crowd and, and the little TV show we had, it was, it was an amazing uh, event. And for me, it was just like, okay, I found my direction. This mm-hmm. is really cool. Yeah. If I try to remember back to those times, there wasn't really that much information on sort of catch wrestling or shoot wrestling. I'm trying to think of who there was. There was Yori Nakamura at the Inosanto Academy doing sort of the shooto shoot wrestling stuff and Eric Paulson 
and, the, and he was busy fighting. And then there was more like the Tony Ciccini and the Matt Fury guys who, I mean, I don't know what your association is with them, but from the outside, it looked really cheesy and really, yeah. um, I, I think probably there's still a bad taste in a lot of old timers mouths associated with those guys. Well, I mean, I, I, I personally remember learning. I, so I had everything from, from all those guys, even Bart Vale had some shoot oh, fighting right. stuff. Uh, and Bart, you know, all, Bart Vale was a, a guy in pro wrestling Fujiwara Gumi, which was a, a shoot style mm -hmm. organization. Uh, and he so fought, it, uh, he fought in MMA as well. He did like, I think he had three yeah. MMA matches, uh, or fights and, and yeah. So I mean, tough guy, I don't think he did really that great in MMA, but he was a little bit older when, when all of this was starting. So, you know, who knows a prime Bart Vale with his amazing mullet, you know, would have been, uh, would have been <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there wasn't much to, to learn from. I, I actually understood this concept of catch wrestling from, uh, from learning about Japanese pro wrestling and Carl Gotch and understanding that, that the, the foundation of, of that was what they called shoot wrestling, which was really just another name for catch. And so I started kind of looking around, you know, at the time it was, you know, I don't know how I found this, but I found Tony Ciccini, found the Matt Fury stuff. Um, and it was interesting. It was very, for me, it was very cool. It was like this, um, it was like, okay, this is essentially real pro wrestling. Even those guys, I think, wanted to be disassociated from from pro wrestling. So they, you know, they wouldn't really talk about too much the roots. I think Ciccini, though, uh, I can't remember what lineage he he, he uh, had, you know, but I think he talked a lot about Luthez. Um, I ended up talking, I ended up learning from everybody that I could, you know, at the time. Um, but yeah, that, that's how I got to, to catch by understanding that it was really the foundation of, of pro wrestling. And then you start learning the history of it. Uh, and I ended up, I did learn from Luthez, uh, had, you know, several conversations with him uh, in his later years. Uh, very, very helpful. Um, and another catch wrestler, uh, I, I learned from was Sputnik Monroe, who I've was, uh, yeah, this, he, uh, he was a pro wrestler in, um, Memphis, I think it was where his like his claim to fame was. Um, somebody will correct me. <laughs> uh, and he was this really cool guy. I think he wrestled maybe from the 40s to the 70s. In his early days, uh, he worked the the pro wrestling matches at the arenas, what we think of as, as pro wrestling, and he also worked the carnival at shows, the athletic shows, where you would take on all comers. Really? So okay. that yeah. So, so that actually existed because it's hard to tell it, how much that's. I mean. The, the sort of mythology is, you know, the the carnival would pull into town and the guy would take on all comers. And that's why they had to develop uh, catch wrestling. And uh, he'd beat up everybody and they'd pocket the money and then they'd go off to the next town. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's there's a lot of mythology. I think there's also just a, a lot of misunderstanding, just repeating the narrative. And, and of course, the narrative is going to be crafted in a way that is complementary to whoever's sure. telling it. So, uh, and, and, and if you can take anything, you know, from pro wrestling and just add that to this, then it makes that, that storytelling, uh, even mm -hmm. more, uh, over the top, uh, Sputnik. Yeah, he, he did. He worked the, the, the at shows in the early days. Um, and then they kind of went away. The carnival so, kind of went away. So how did these athletic, uh, athletic shows actually work in, and what era are we talking? We're talking in the 1950s here. Uh, at shows were, were happening, uh, from like the, uh, right after, right after the civil war, okay. uh, up until I think around the thirties, thirties and forties is kind of when, okay. so, Sputnik, so, so why don't we jump sorry. back to, I'm, I'm sure you're, you're fairly conversant with the history of how the, the various folk style wrestling in England came over to America. Why don't we start at the beginning? I'm trying to work history backwards, but I think this is sure. an inefficient way to do it. Okay. Can you give us your understanding of how couch wrestling, uh, came to America and then we'll throw the Japan and Brazil angles in later because that's really fascinating as well. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, from my understanding, uh, it was, it was brought over. So Greco Roman wrestling was kind of the, the import from Europe. Um, and you know, it, to my, to my understanding, hasn't changed a whole lot in terms of Greco Roman was still upper body and, and throw based kind of, uh, uh, wrestling, but we have to understand, like when you think of it, Greco Roman or you think of, uh, folk style. You, you think of amateur wrestling, Olympic wrestling. These were guys that did this style professionally for their job. So they, you know, this is what they did. Um, they would, they would still come over 
and and perform, um, you know, if their throws and and they would have matches and they were at, at some point maybe they were 100 percent shoot, but you know at, at any at some point you realize you can't do that very often. You know you can't have constant just total shoot fights. It's just not going to work, even with uh, probably a style like like Greco Roman. So uh, you know these were pros, and and then what happened was I again this is my understanding of how it worked was another style came over uh, from Lancashire in in England, and it was this thing called catches catch can catches catch can wrestling, uh, which was very much it was a full body wrestling, uh, very much like um, we think of as freestyle wrestling, but with some submissions. And and that kind of started to catch on uh, where, where Greco Roman was looked at as just kind of one dimensional and, and maybe even more European. And for some reason, maybe people looked at catch as being something that that wasn't European. Yeah, it was English, but, you know, maybe that's not as bad. So anyway, eventually we had both and then we it kind of just seemed to settle on on catch wrestling. And these guys in the in the earlier days, they they needed to make money, and the best way to do that was go into a town, or go into a, a, a lumber camp, or or a gym and have challenge matches. And just who who wants to take them on? And then they would have a promoter who would say, uh, "I bet you can't hang with my my, my dude here. Uh, and you know, if you can, we put in some money, and if you if you can, you know, you'll get more money out of it." Mm. And that was basically the the start of it. And so the at shows were a much more focused version of this where the the troupe would come into town as part of the carnival and in addition so it was an athletic show so it was the it was the wrestling probably some boxing uh you know weightlifting feats of strength uh acrobatics things like that it was a side show mm-hmm. and and you know basically they would they would make the challenge who's who's man enough uh or woman enough but i think it was mostly men to to you know stand up with our with our pro and that sounds nice it sounds like this is going to be a shoot fight. Um, I'm going to have to learn how to hook somebody fast and rip their arm off and, and send the townie running. Just, it, it didn't really play out like that. It was all, all work. Really? So uh, how would they, when you say as a work, it's, you were saying prearranged. Yeah. So they, they would plant a guy in the well, audience? Some, yeah, there you mm-hmm. go. So it was, some of it was, some of it had to be real occasionally. Occasionally, the rest was going to get Absolutely. pissed off enough at some guy chirping them from the uh, from the stands. But right, right. But you're this saying if they did that every day, ego. then and they I, would just I, be too beat up. If if, if it was exactly, yeah. yeah. You, Robert Drysdale, yeah, when he was on my doing podcast this... recently, talking about catch wrestling in Brazil and sort of the Japanese jiu jitsu uh, demonstrations in Brazil. That most of them were probably works as well. They prearranged. It's just way too much mileage on the body to have a essentially an MMA fight every second day yeah. with the biggest, toughest guy in the town. I mean, it's like rolling with beginners is the most dangerous thing you can do in jiu-jitsu. Now, just think of a super <laughs> drunk, right, right. super large beginner who's just you know trying to rip your eyeballs out. It, it's it, you're probably exactly. going to win, but you're going to take a lot of damage along the way. And that's that's the thing. I mean, where they were. Think about that. Think about what it would what that situation. And and you need to control them enough to get the audience to buy into this whole thing, but keep them at bay so they don't they don't hurt you because they're 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 spazzing out. Right. That think about you know guys somebody that comes in as a, as a brand new white belt is going to spaz out, and they sort of have an idea of what they're getting themselves into. These are people that that you know if we think about the time. I mean, so what late 1800s early 1900s there wasn't a lot of wrestling in in school there wasn't a jiu-jitsu gym on every corner mm-hmm. most people had no idea how to actually uh, wrestle or really probably even fight they had no no idea which makes them dangerous but also is an opportunity right if we really know what we're doing so the the catch wrestlers would would make the challenge and This is what they would do. They would take on actual townies, but they would kind of prioritize them. All right. So the first few matches we're going to have with these these less tough looking townies that that stepped up and uh, and 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 said they would they would fight. And then, you know, we're going to save the big guys for uh, for later. Right. And so the they would bring the the townie in 
and they would work it by basically making him look good, carrying him, carrying him to a, a, a decent match, and then they'd lose. Why would the pro oh. lose to the townie? It's just like a three card Monty game where uh, I saw a three card Monty game once on 42nd Avenue in New York. And there was this guy doing the three card Monty stuff. And there's this black woman there who was just winning hundreds of dollars. And uh, this guy's apparently just giving away money because he's forgetting that the queen or whatever you're supposed to follow has got a bend in it. So everyone <laughs> watching clearly has figured out that this guy's giving away money for free. And uh, then he just proceeded to fleece everyone uh, because the you know, the Confederate the person who was in on it is obviously in on it. So yep. all right, so so yeah. then so you've you've convinced the people that it's possible to win, and then what? Yep. Well, and so what we don't know is that the promoters made a bet uh, against his guy. Everybody, uh, this is a side bet game. This was all about the side bets, and and of course people were going to bet on the pro. It's it's a it's a pro wrestler mm -hmm. uh, at the time. This is like you know crazy. The superhero came into town uh, to beat us all up. The promoter bets against his guy. His guy loses. There we go. So the next match, the the townies are still sort of thinking the same thing. Like okay, that was or that was a fluke. Uh, we're gonna bet on the pro. Match happens. Carries the the townie to a decent match and loses. Man. Okay. All right. What's going on here? Maybe we're tougher than we thought, you know, and then they would bet uh, on their guy. The problem is at that point, this is where most people say it was, you know, this is this is what proves everything was was a shoot. Because, of course, at that point, you would get a guy in the ring. Everybody would point to like, that's the toughest guy. Right. Well, we're going to say we'll, we'll save save him for the the main event. Well, we're at the main event time and we're saying, uh, all right, it's, we're going to bring up this 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 townie that everybody's pointing to. I'm going to have to hook this guy quick. In fact, we're probably going to have a, a referee that's from the town. Like they're not going to, we're, we're going to say, you know, just to make sure that this is all on the up and up. Like you get to pick the opponent, you get to pick the referee. And so the opponent gets in the ring, the referee gets in the ring. Now the referee is, is from the town. Do you think the referee is going to count the shoulders of, of the townie? They're going to have a slow count. Uh, if, if he's tapping out, you know, saying he gives up, but, but only the referee can hear it. He's not going to say it because he wants to save face. So what do we have to do? We have to be rippers and hookers. We got to be able to hook these guys quick and, and just, and don't tap them out and don't choke them out. Don't make them go to sleep. We need to break bones. We need to rip joints, right? That's, that's what we have to do to these guys. So the first two matches we carried them and they beat us. Maybe there's another match in there where, where it's more competitive and we win, but you know, whatever, we're at the main event now. This is this is where all the working goes out the window. And so this is where the the the, the catch wrestling like this is where everything comes from, because I'm going to get that rep, that that opponent's going to get in there with me and I'm just going to just hook them, neck crank them, rip their head off, hold their head up, collect my winnings and leave. All right. Except where are all the broken bodies? Where are the stories of people limping down the street in the town? Because the catch wrestlers ruin their their lives. There are stories. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of proof of that. What I understand, and this is just what I understand to be true, is that that last townie that was the big tough guy that everybody pointed to, that was that was part of the promoter's troop. He just came into town at a different time. Maybe he came in a couple days earlier or, or, or longer and sort of established himself. He got a job <laughs> or, or just wow. showed up. Like it, he was going to work himself into the town and everybody was going to going to pick him. He was the obvious pick for the show and he would get in there with the with the pro and everybody would bet on this other guy because, man, the pros aren't aren't that tough. And 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 this guy is awesome. And we've seen him win some some matches down at the gym or we've we've heard stories. He gets in there and the pro wins. He puts the pro over. Now, the promoter has all the money. Uh, and, 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 and the gimmick is up, but here's the thing about that. From what I understand, the reason they started doing the plant thing, there was some, apparently some truth to the idea that, that we would get a, a, a you know, really awesome or, you know, intimidating guy from the crowd and, and have to hook him. But sometimes there would be another type of pro wrestler 
that would come to town outside of the troop, establish himself as the town badass, and then show up at the at show and everybody would pick him and he'd be like, me? And then he would get on, get up in the ring and the other guy would recognize this dude. Oh, oh crap. This is like, this is that other guy. This is a legit. So we've got like this multiple levels guy. of deception on going on here. Yes. This is we've, a, basically a double cross, but nobody could, who, you can't say anything. Yeah. You can't be like, wait a minute, that guy's an actual wrestler. Be like, well, wait, I thought you could be. So the promoter just basically started doing that instead you know, not allowing an outside guy to come in and establish the town first. So this is, I mean, even the, the, the thing that you could look at and say, take on all comers. How could you have worked that? There you go. And my, my thing is that's awesome. (laughs) That's a neat, that's a cool backstory. And, and what I find is that people in who want to make catch wrestling respectable, try to make the history of catch wrestling respectable. And I'm saying it was what it was. It was dirty. But and it's that undeniably mean... dangerous. You're going to be chased out of town by a lot of angry townies at some point when they realize yes. that the whole thing was fake from beginning to end and they just lost all their money. A large part of catch wrestling was running, <laughs> if I understand right. Conditioning to the after train. the fight. Exactly. Post-fight <laughs> conditioning. It's a lost art these days. Yeah. People just leave the ring as if they're not in huge trouble. So, so yeah, it's yeah. so if I'm a promoter, let's just see if I got this right. I'm a promoter. Mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm coming to I don't know Tulsa. I send two weeks ahead of time. I send my my a respectable wrestler there to work his way into town and start working at the mill or whatever and working out at the gym. Then I pull up and I plant a bunch of guys in the audience who my guy is going to wrestle and lose against. Maybe I scrap with a townsperson if I think I'm not going to lose too badly or if it helps develop the plot. And I win or I lose, depending on on the situation. And then for the big finale, where everyone's betting the big money, having built up my reputation of my fighter as a total loser, I fight the guy who I've already planted in town a couple of weeks beforehand. And then we all skedaddle. Yeah, and I'm going to beat that guy because nobody thought I would win. And, and we take all the side bets and it's, it's a, it's just a big scam. Um, yeah, it, you understand it perfectly. I think that's, that's great. I mean, like, you know, I don't want to, I don't want people ripping anybody off, but like, I just, the, it, the history is what it is. And I think you see a lot of trying to rewrite history. I mean, you see this everywhere. It's not just catch, but like the, the revisionist history about this being somehow respectable, uh, is just not true. So then, what should we talk about next? Should we talk about sort of the circus in Brazil or should we yeah. talk about the influence of or catch wrestling goes to Japan? I guess catch wrestling really went to Japan when Carl Gotch went to Japan. That was kind of the big breakthrough. So let's go, let's talk about uh, Brazil first. Cause sure. as again, as Robert Drysdale pointed out, there's no television, there's no internet, there's no entertainment, there's no nothing. When the circus comes to town, that's where you're going. And that's the really the only entertainment going on. I mean, maybe if you're in Manaus, you go to the opera house, you know, on Wednesdays, but then what are you going to do on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Right. Yeah. I mean, the circus was, was huge and it was for all those reasons. Um, and you had guys like, uh, Maeda, um, who had established himself in the U S, um, before the U S band. Yeah. Todd in the U S had a, had a, had a school in, uh, in New York city, uh, this was before the U.S. banned immigration uh, by basically anybody who wasn't white. Uh, and so he was already there. But very quickly, very quickly, from what I understand, you know, less than a year into his 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 being in the U.S., he was already establishing or he's already working in, in pro wrestling circles, at least running with the pro wrestlers, if not working matches himself. Um, and the weird thing is he didn't seem to have heat with Kodakon. Um like Kimura did later on. Kimura mm-hmm. came about 20 years or, or so later. Yeah. Um, but 1950s. both of those guys, yeah, both of those guys made their way to Brazil, essentially doing carnivals. Uh, Maeda for sure. Cause the, the story is the, um, the Gracie's, um, and I don't, I, I, I believe Elia was there. I don't know who else, um, uh, Carlos or George. I can't remember. Anyway, went to a circus, saw this dude 
performing um, demonstrations and and working matches and met him. And that was essentially the the the, the catalyst for what we know as as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I don't think people want to hear that. Yeah. There was an era of judo guys. Now, if you ask most judo guys who was the greatest judoka of all time, a lot of them will mention Yamashita, right? He went like 200 matches undefeated in Olympic level, which is amazing. But the earlier era would refer to Kimura, like guys who came up in the 1980s, guys who were doing judo in the 1980s, they'd still harken back to the golden era of Kimura. And they'd all be these stories, apocryphal and otherwise, about how he would win these matches and how hard he would train. But then if you ask him what was Kimura doing in Brazil touring with the circus, they get very, very quiet. So this generation yeah. of judoka would still be really embarrassed by the fact that their great god of judo, Kimura, was off, you know, fighting carnival matches. Right. And I guess he needed to pay the bills somehow, and it paid better than being an old, broken-up judoka. Well, for sure. So I, I don't know. My, my, my hypothesis is that uh, Maeda who was doing the same things, but Kodakon didn't seem to disown him there. Uh, apparently some people didn't like the fact that he did pro wrestling, but that was about it. They didn't not like him. In fact, they, they promoted him. They kept promoting him like six or seven Don or whatever. Like it was, mm -hmm. it was crazy. My, what I suspect is, you know, he was probably in some way giving back to Kodakon. So he was making money, but he was paying his licensing fee. Kimura had, a kid and and a sick wife. His wife had tuberculosis, from from what I understand, and it was expensive to treat. I, I, I we don't think of things like that back then, but apparently that was a thing. And so, he may not have been kicking back any any of his uh, dues. And so, Kodakon really didn't like what he was doing. They they froze him at a, a at a certain rank level and and said, as long as you're out there uh, teaching other people what we taught you and, and working these pro wrestling matches, we don't want anything to do with you. So it was very, two very different, um, scenarios, but they were, they were both out there working, working matches. The thing that I, I think is insane, Stefan, and I, I, for, this is really like the idea that somebody can, can't be an amazing fighter, can't be an amazing judoka, can't be an amazing Brazilian jiu-jitsu person, can't be whatever, because they would do worked matches mm -hmm. is insane. That's like saying, well, you, you went off and did a movie, so you're not, you're not, any, any, you're not a good fighter. <laughs> what? So these guys had to make money. There was no money in martial arts back then. There was no money in, in this stuff. They had to put on a show. And it wasn't all worked fights. It was demonstrations uh, that just, you know, nor like that kind of stuff where that's apparently okay. But until you get into a match and it's, and you're pretending something like all of a sudden you have, you know, your actual skills are no longer valid. And I just think those two things are not mutually exclusive. I guess you would train somewhat differently if you were just training for one or the other. If I'm never going to have to put my stuff to the test, then I would just practice the most flashy moves ever. I would only practice, I don't know, the, the reverse fireman's throw or the, the DDT, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if I'm going to have to apply it for real every day, I'm going to use a different subset of skills that are going to generally be less flashy. I mean, yeah, there'll be the Superman punch, there'll be the, you know, the cartwheel kicks, but generally yeah. speaking, and I'm talking MMA here, same applies yeah. to jiu-jitsu. So... If you were just doing one or the other, I could see the, the style evolving to just meet the needs of, of that. I mean, pro wrestlers nowadays don't fight any real, they don't, they don't fight shoots by and large. Right. Is that, that's, that's correct. Yeah. I mean, I think there's still several, several guys, uh, that, that, that I know of like Timothy Thatcher in, in NXT is probably one of the, uh, he's on the biggest stage, he's probably one of the most legit guys, um, catch wrestler, really amazing. You know, he, he would, he would do shoots off, you know, not on TV. Like the, the training would probably be very similar actually. Mm. Um, you, when you go into a, a, a worked match, you just change your style. That said, if you look back at some of the, the stuff in, in the era that we call Inokiism, So Antonio Inoki ran new Japan pro wrestling and, 
and founded it and, and ran it for years. The guy with a gigantic said, chin. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, he, he said that pro wrestling is the strongest style, right? That was his, that was his thing. The strongest style of fighting. And he would do these mixed fights. And the most famous one uh, was with Muhammad Ali and, and he would, but he would go around, he claimed to be the world martial arts champion. And he would have these mixed fights with different uh, people from different styles. It was actually, it was very early MMA. If you want to look at it that way. The legitimacy of those matches is probably to be questioned. Really? Um, I thought the yeah. Ali Inoki fight, uh, if it's out there for people to watch, right. is so boring that it's probably real. I mean, really, I can sum up the fight. Inoki comes, flops to his back, kicks at Ali's shins. At the end of the round, they get stood up. Ali throws one punch, Inoki goes to his back. And at one point, if I recall correctly, somehow entangles Ali's legs and he goes down, and then I forget what happens. But it's it's really a, a job to suffer through that fight. I mean, unless it's you're awesome. a martial arts historian nerd, which is why I watched it. Sure. For for the sheer history of it, mm -hmm. you should watch it. For entertainment value, probably not. Um, yeah, so this was one of those situations. It was supposed to be a work, from what I understand, it's supposed to be a work. Uh, and and Ali and his, his guys said, no, we don't want to do that. Um, and so to make it a shoot, but make it something that they would, that, that they would actually do, they agreed on crazy rules. And so the reason that, uh, Inoki was on his back kicking was because that was basically the only thing he was allowed to do, um, in, in their rule set. And he kicked, uh, Ali so much, he developed blood clots and had to go to the hospital and stuff. It was, it was brutal from that standpoint, but it was brutal to watch, which is why we need worked matches to sometimes real fights are not that entertaining. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously sometimes they are, but yeah. very often, you know, they're not. I was watching a, a, a jujitsu event the other day. It was streaming. A friend sent it to me and it was a couple of blue belts standing there. Nobody doing anything for like mm -hmm. 10 minutes. And I sent it back and I said, why am I, why am I watching this? <laughs> I said, this is why we need worked matches. Uh, because, you know, it's not, sometimes it's not entertaining. You know, it is what it is. It's, you know, a real fight's a real fight or a real, you know, a, a shoot matches. There have match. been various, I think the, the Gracie brothers had a tournament once where if something didn't happen for a certain amount of time on the feet, you'd flip a coin and one guy would have to go down to the guard. The other guy would start. Yeah. It was something like that. It's kind of like the opposite of the UFC stand-up rule. If nothing's happening right. on the ground, <laughs> you stand them up. And I've yeah. often thought the UFC should have a, if nothing's happening on the feet, put them down on the ground rule right it, it, mm -hmm. uh, let's see if we can get an exciting fight out of this somehow yeah uh, oh i thought I, I i remember i thought it'd be cool to, to start the fight like randomly choose a different starting position each you know just like instead of standing up and, and together and then i saw like ebi rules matches where they they yeah. go into an overtime and and one guy starts with a, a rear naked choke already on and i was like eh, i don't know so <laughs> you know this may be why it's never going to get mainstream acceptance sometimes is like these rules are weird but rules are basically if if we think about it the 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 gimmick for mma rules for unified rules or whatever is fighter safety sure but there's a large part of it that's also meant to make it entertaining just to keep the action going sure um that's i we can't look past that so just literally sure. the style um, the, the round system doesn't contribute to fighter safety the round system is a way to give Tired fighters a chance to get a second wind, and if nothing's happened on the ground, to get them standing back up. Like that's right. what it is. Uh, the stand-up rules are based around rolling the dice. That it's more exciting to watch two guys throwing haymakers at each other than it is to watch one guy trying to pass the half guard to somebody else. Yeah. The the gloves aren't for fighter safety. I mean, I hope that's now well established. Yeah. If you take one of my fists and you wrap it with gauze for 10 minutes and then put gloves on top of it, with that fist, I can punch a cinder block wall. With my mm -hmm. other fist, I can punch a cinder block wall once. Yeah. Maybe twice if I'm hyped up on adrenaline, but then no more. Those gloves are not to protect the head of the opponent. It's to, it's to stop broken hands and to make it more exciting. Yep. Yeah, so I mean, that's just reality. And, and again, you know, talk about... Yeah, I'm not even May. passing judgment, but I'm saying like, no. let's not pretend that this isn't hasn't been nudged along to make a more exciting fight that thank you that's it you know that's that's what i want is like yes no judgment i in fact that's great if if 
if matches, if the rules weren't there to make the fights more entertaining, MMA would not be where it is today. What do you think of those absolutely insane 10 on 10 matches that you see from <laughs> Russia, the 10 on 10 MMA fights? I mean, that's a guilty pleasure for me and I don't watch too many of them, but it's <laughs> like, oh my God, you're watching it and like, I, somebody's going to die. Really? That's what it is. It's, it's almost no, like it, car wreck voyeurism. <laughs> The, the one where they're on different objects yeah. and, and they're like falling off. That's that, that was uh, crazy. But yeah, you can't look away. I just watched a, a fight show from, from Thailand, I think called uh, fight circus. And it had some two on one matches and oh some tag God. team matches. Uh, but my favorite, it had two types of, of fights that were awesome. One was a kick only fight. <laughs> so, you know, it had like a karate guy and a Muay Thai, Muay Thai guy that were just could only use their legs. It was brutal, though. I mean, it was like it was pretty, pretty crazy. But my favorite was the spin fight. The only thing you could do was spinning attacks. Oh, my God. <laughs> so spinning elbows, like, yeah. spinning, spinning back elbows, fists. spin kicks. One guy was a capoeira okay. guy. And so, you know, he was doing it, it was it was a rule set made for entertainment. But that was a shoot. You know, mm -hmm. as far as it, it, I could tell, these look mm -hmm. like guys that were actually trying to win. But within that rule set. So have you seen? Now we're totally going off on a tangent, yeah, but just... hey, it's my podcast, <laughs> Tangents for Us. There's something I see on television very occasionally at the Fire Hall, because I don't have one at home, and it's the Ultimate Tag Championship. It's yes. this, oh, it's yeah, this yeah. weird thing where there's beams and stairs and platforms and fences and this kind of parkour tag. Yeah. So what we need to do is merge parkour tag with the Team MMA yes. and put lots of hard corners in there and uh, just that would be something. If you, you you only win when it, through some sort of being taken away on a stretcher, yeah. that would be um that, that would be amazing. In fact, I I liked American Gladiators hmm. back in the day because when they ran their mazes and stuff, you could you could tackle the other person. Mm -hmm. And an ultimate tag uh, doesn't seem to be any tag uh, any actual tackling. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all it's all just tag. And I'm like, you could you could take it up a notch or two. Uh, I'm sure Red Bull violence. will get their hands on it. And then they'll have like. <laughs> Ultimate Tag Snowboard Edition Full Contact Version. So. See, now you're, this, this is brainstorming. This is, this is how the good yes. ideas happen. <laughs> Let's jump back to Brazil for a minute. Sure. So one of the stories that's told in catch wrestling is that we have leg locks. We have toe holds, we have heel hooks, we have ankle locks. Um, and a lot of them were used not so much to submit a guy, it's the versions I hear. They were used to turn the guy over to pin him. So basically, you put the guy in a dilemma. You're going to let me snap your ankle or you're going to roll over to your back and let me pin you. I don't know if that's true or not, and I'd love for you to comment on that. But then if we fast forward to the time when I was getting into jiu-jitsu in the early 90s, there was still the Luta Livre people, the no-gi people in Brazil, who had really only trained no-gi, uh, Eugenio Tadeau and those guys. And then there was uh, the, the jiu-jitsu people, and they'd basically only train with a gi, and they'd probably take the gi off a week before they fought in the UFC. <laughs> and the Luta Livre people, the no-gi people, really had a lot more leg locks. There were a there's some photos of Helio doing an ankle lock, but really, in the early 90s, as a general rule that's only 95% correct, there were really no leg locks in jiu-jitsu. The ones that were there weren't highly developed and nobody ever went for them. And if you went for them in a tournament, you would be booed yeah. out of the stadium. Yeah. yeah. So is that sort of Luta Livre love of leg locks coming from catch wrestling in Brazil? Yep. Okay. Uh, you had, you had the catch wrestlers that went to Brazil and they, they taught, they taught the local guys and, and that's where that comes from. Um, Luta Livre, uh, in, in Portuguese is free fight. Um, it basically is a, is a translation, uh, in, 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 in some way of catch wrestling. They wanted to call, they didn't want to call it catch wrestling. They could have, they, there's a lot of uh, American or English words that, you know, uh, American terms or, or English words that are used in Portuguese. There's no reason they couldn't have called it catch wrestling. In fact, pro wrestling became uh was was known by the show title which was um telecatch okay televised wrestling so catch 
if, if you go back to French and stuff, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a linguist uh, or language expert or lingu language historian. Lingu but, linguiologist, um, I think, is the word. See, I didn't know that. So clearly, I'm not one. Um, catch goes back to to at least I, I remember seeing it in, in in French wrestling early on. So I don't know where it comes from, but uh, I mean, in, in terms of like being associated with um, with pro wrestling in that way, unless it really just actually dates back to what we know of as catch wrestling. And I'm, I'm not really sure. So, but, um, they call it telecatch pro, they call pro wrestling in Brazil telecatch, uh, because of the TV show that was, it was on, but they call it Luta Livre for the simple reason of not wanting it to be catch because catch comes with carny baggage hmm. and it, it doesn't in the U S and it does in Brazil. It, it was brought there in the circuses okay. and as a, as a, as a positioning thing, we call it Luta Livre. In Japan, catch wrestling is usually referred to as shoot wrestling. The same thing. Mm -hmm. And the lineage, I mean, it goes back to Carl Gotch teaching guys catch wrestling, but for whatever wa reason, wanting to differentiate it from the Carney background, wanted to differentiate it even from Carl Gotch, who was a pro wrestler. So they called it shoot wrestling or real shoot wrestling. Shoot boxing or shooto. <laughs> Right. So shoot boxing was a was an offshoot of, of shoot wrestling by a guy that was much more of a, a, of a kickboxer. And then Shuto was a was Tiger Mask, of all people, uh, you know, took the idea of, of shoot wrestling and, and the shoot style through these different iterations of UWF, uh, Universal Wrestling Federation, and then UWFI, which was well, UWF became UWFI, which is Union of Wrestling Forces International and all these kind of offshoots of the shoot style. But then um uh, Tiger Mask basically said, "I want to do this for real," and he created Shuto, which is not, you know, still still going on. It's much more like MMA now, but it started out kind of um, almost real pro wrestling, kind of like Pancreas, also, which was founded by guys. But anyway, so Luta Livre uh, is just catch wrestling, and and there's been an effort. And again, this is just what I what I've heard, and then there's actually documentaries out there on this where you look at um, some of the you look at the lineage of at least some of the Luta Libre, it goes back to this uh, guy that was called uh, Tattoo. And uh, he, the, the documentaries are trying to do that revisionist history thing where they say he never, you know, he wasn't a carnival guy. He wasn't a, a, a worker. He was, a, he, he never did anything in any way that wasn't legitimate. And then the videos that they show are obviously worked matches. So it's like, just why? Just embrace it, but you know we still have that that idea that you it, you can't have done work matches and also have been a good fighter, and that's just not not true. Uh, you know, to your point earlier, if you're not training MMA, you're not training Valley Tudo, or you're not training Jiu-Jitsu, just you know to be the most proficient at that. If you come in as being sort of this hybrid or just a dabbler in all these different things, you're probably going to get beaten by the guy that's focused 100% on that style. But it doesn't mean that if you you know, if you focused on it, you wouldn't also be good. But if you're doing pro wrestling, you're right. It is a certain style and, you know, you can train shoot behind the scenes. But if that's all you're doing, you know, you may not be able to hang with some really high level shoot fighters um, until you train back up. You know, but I don't think that means that you're not a good fighter. So, so tell me more about Tattoo and the people that he trained. Did this lead to people like Marco Huas? And, and, and those guys? It seems to be. And, and if, you, if you look at the, uh, the, the different, the, there's a Valley Tudo organization that has a whole lineage and a, a family tree. And it does, it, it, everybody that's, that we would know of in, in Luta Livre seems to sort of all go up to, uh, to these guys, uh, Tattoo uh, and, and uh, Dadu, uh, which I think was, was his trainer. And, and I just can't, I honestly, I can't remember what their real names are uh, at this point, um, but uh, too many too many chair shots to the head. Uh, <laughs> but I remember their nicknames, and, and tattoo means armadillo, and dadu I have no idea what that means. I don't know where that comes from. Um, but you know these were the guys that so that yeah were were the the foundation of of luta livre, and you sort of mentioned this earlier. Like you had luta livre and you had Brazilian jiu jitsu and you had essentially luta livre. It was a there was a class war, hmm. right? So, yeah, I mean, the Gracies the, the, had their friends who were generals and politicians and bankers. And I know the Jiu Gracie Jiu Jitsu 
was very expensive to train and Luta Livre was generally lower class. I mean, I, I don't know. In the same way that capoeira was looked down upon. If you were black and from the, uh, from the ghettos, you probably did capoeira. If you were upper class and worked in a bank, you might do jujitsu. Yeah. I mean, Brazil, uh, for all the, all the things that I love about it, I mean, it's history is, is pretty messed up. Um, just like the U S and, and in, in terms of slavery and racism and all of that stuff. So you definitely had, um, you had I, Capoeira was, was, was definitely, um, probably looked down upon, uh, by, by re regular society. Uh, and then you had, uh, Luta Livre, which was, which was for the poor kids. Um, the, the favelas, um, these are the guys that couldn't afford geese is the, mm -hmm. is the story at least. Um, from what I understand, you know, Tattoo would, would go fight and, you know, get, you know, come back with a new car or something. So, I mean, like there was money, at least in what he was, what he was doing. And now in terms of training, was there money in, in being a martial arts uh, instructor at the time? I, I have, I, I don't have any, any evidence that there was. So, you know, why else, why do people teach? Sometimes you teach because you just want to, mm -hmm. you want to pass this on you want it to be something more than it, than it currently is, you know, they wanted to promote Luta Livre. Well, you can't do that if you don't have anybody else mm -hmm. to, you know, the next generation or, or, or team members. So I don't know that there was money strictly in, uh, in, in th that part of the martial arts business, but bringing up a team and going out and having challenge fights or sending people back to the circus, um, that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's probably where, where there was some money. I don't think it was, uh, you know, probably big money, but from what I, I, that's all that I can think of in terms of why you would, you would do that. So you've trained jujitsu. Have you trained jujitsu in Brazil? I have. Okay. Uh, Where'd you train? Uh, I trained in, in the city called Belo Horizonte, which is, uh, uh, where I had some clients and, uh, asked, you know, does anybody client train such an ambiguous term? Yeah. I mean, I do, I do business consulting. Okay. Um, and so I had, uh, couple of companies in that in that city uh, they they brought me down the last time I was there it was in January and so um, I try to do this wherever I can but the, the last time was January uh, one of the guys said uh, I want to take you to train with us and so I got to uh, I got to go only only you know that that hasn't been something that I've uh, been able to do uh, as much I've done pro wrestling in Brazil I've trained pro wrestling and I've and I've wrestled there um, on shows for uh, Brazilian Wrestling Federation this was my first jujitsu uh, hmm. experience in Brazil, and uh, it was awesome. And you know, I think the everybody's always so afraid of Brazil. Just just says it's going to be this uh, this dangerous thing. And I started going in 2015 uh, for for my shoot job for business. Um, was <laughs> asked job. to come down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, that's the way we talk in 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 pro wrestling. Um, I went down and uh, in, in 2015 to speak at a conference, fell in love with it, and uh, and have gone back. I think the one my trip in, in January 2020 was my 15th or 16th trip there. Wow. Yeah, and and uh, but that was my first jujitsu experience in in uh, in Brazil. I've done I've trained all sorts of things over the years. Never stuck with anything long enough, uh, probably except other than pro wrestling and catch. Uh, but I started training at a jujitsu gym here in Dallas with my, that's where my friend goes and just doing the no-gi stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to get more reps outside of my pro wrestling training. And um, I was like, I kind of got to, got to know the, 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 the jujitsu guys there and felt like I wanted to experience it in, mm -hmm. in Brazil the next time I go. And, you know, I went in humble and, you know, just uh, made sure through my friend that, you know, I'm just, uh, made sure through my friend that it was cool, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, uh, so it was all kind of set up ahead of time and it's amazing, you know, like people will treat you good if you treat them good. Yeah. Um, and I speak, I speak some Portuguese, but like not in that setting. So it was hard to understand and everything was really fast and they were playing uh, really cool Brazilian music and uh, super tiny space <laughs> packed with people right before the pandemic hit. Uh, and now I can't, I can't imagine. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Oh my God. We don't uh, want to think about so, it. Yeah. But it was, it was awesome. And you know, if, if you're ever in Brazil, um, uh, you should seek out a, you know, a, a place to train because it's, it's just a completely different experience than, uh, 
uh, at least my experiences with, with Brazilian Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in the U.S. Um, I, I, everybody, so you would you would go in and you would greet the higher belts, the higher ranks, you know, kind of go over and shake their hand. I just watched, and then I realized I should do that too, and it seemed more respectful hmm. than my experience here. Um, okay. Not not that here is like not re- not respectful, but it seemed more like a martial art okay. versus what I've what I've experienced here. So you've been to Brazil that number of times and you kind of left something hanging. You said people talk about how dangerous it is. And certainly yeah. that is a common story. Have you had any problems in Brazil, any carjackings, kidnappings, robberies, anything like that? Not that I remember. Oh, no. So, <laughs> no, no. no it, it's, you it's also aren't the target demographic look for, you know, any a pushover and easy mark. Well, thank you, man. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean th- that's the thing is is no matter where you are, have confidence and, and probably you're got you're not going to be the person they mess with, mm-hmm. um, you know whether that's walking outside in Dallas or or, or somewhere in Brazil. Mm-hmm. I mean that's that's just a it's just something that you should do. Um, no, it's funny. So I was invited to speak at the event uh, in 2015, right around the same time, and I already committed to it. Right around the same time, a friend of mine in Australia reached out and said, Hey, I would like to have you come speak at our event. And it was the same day or maybe, you know, the same week as the one in Brazil. And I said, I can't, I can't make that work. And he said, okay, cool. And then uh, another couple of days later, I got an email from him with a link that compared the likelihood of dying a, a violent death to <laughs> Brisbane, Australia and Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I was like, all right, man, I'll tell you what, if I survive my trip to Brazil, I'll come to your event. Next I'll come year. to your country, which is laden with more poisonous snakes, cro- <laughs> man-eating crocodiles, scorpions, yeah. spiders, you know, pl- dinner plate sized spiders, and probably poisonous flying bats. Uh, yeah. And I, I won't get murdered, but I'll get poisoned. And then exactly eaten. right. Yeah. Exactly. So, what kind of consulting do you do, and is it sort of based on your career in pro wrestling? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, so I do this thing called customer success, which is, um, it's a, it's, we want businesses to grow and, and the best way to grow is to keep your customers longer and have them pay you more by buying, buying more stuff from you over time. And then even better is if they go out and tell other people about you, like that's a great growth engine. So that's what I, that's what I do. I help companies, mostly tech technology companies implement that, that strategy. Uh, I think a lot of what I understand about the way customers work, the way humans work, actually comes from my my pro wrestling. Can you give an Um, example? Yeah, I mean, what what motivates people? um, You know, everything about active listening. So, you know, having empathy, um, uh, paying attention to what uh, they're saying and, and, and actually paraphrasing it back to them. These are active listening things that we would have a customer success manager do with their customer, right? Listen for what the customer is saying, but also pay attention to the emotion in that so that we can move them in the right direction. Pro wrestling in, in, in the way that we do it today is, is very similar to that. Um, I, so I said pro wrestling is not fake. It's not. It's worked. But I, never, I also never said it's scripted. Now, that's where a lot of people kind of don't understand. I think you, you, you have this great script that you remember. I can't remember anything, man. Uh, I, I, would, I would fail at that. <laughs> but what you do have is, is sort of a framework. And, and within that framework, think of it as improv. Hmm. Um, you and I have, have both trained up in this framework. And so now, given certain... Um, uh, parameters that we plug in, we can put on the match that the promoter wants. This is how I can go to, to Israel and Mexico and Brazil and ha- wrestle with people that I might not even speak the same language with mm. and, and have it be something that actually is, is potentially and hopefully entertaining. It's this, this, this framework. So it's really about improv. And, and part of that is paying attention to the audience. Mm-hmm. You know, if I go out, if I'm the good guy, which is rare because that's not, that just doesn't work for me. But if I'm the good guy, 
and and we're we're wrestling and the audience is telling us that they want the other guy to be the good guy and they don't like me i can choose to ignore that and just do what i want and do what i think is uh maybe even best for me going to put me over big or i can listen to the audience and give them what they want and that's that's how i've always done things some people with a big ego just want to get their uh, get their stuff in all of their big moves and make you know make themselves look good, but I just really wanted to make sure the audience leaves happy, that they leave having had the time that they expected, and if that means that in the process they're going to hate me, cool, you know. <laughs> You're giving and them kinda, the gift of hatred. Yeah, it, at least in the in the in the moment, so they yeah. can get angry, they can take out the frustrations that they can't anywhere else. Now, the difference between customer success and pro wrestling. Maybe the only difference. No, there's, I, I would I would venture to say there's a few differences. But one of the key things in customer success is we're not trying to solve for the customer's happiness. I, I can't. This is an entertainment. This is a business relationship. I I'm going to be I'm going to have empathy for you. I'm going to pay attention and 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 make sure that I'm I'm hearing you and that you know whatever. But I can't. I'm not going to make you happy if you are emotionally unhappy. Um, I, I, I'm not a psychopath. I would like the people around me to be emotionally happy, but I mm -hmm. can't solve for that in that setting. That's different. In pro wrestling, it's all about emotional happiness. But we, don't, we also don't have any delusion that when you leave after watching a match, we've solved all of your problems, right? All we did was distract you. You know, you got to have a good time. So we're solving for happiness in pro wrestling. We're solving for success, the goal you want to achieve in customer success. But the way we get there, the fact that humans are involved with, you know, in a business, yeah, you we have a business as a client, but it's, it's made up of humans and those humans have emotions and they have the way that, that humans operate. If we understand that, we can do the things that are necessary to get them to take the actions that we need them to take in order to be successful. So what's the craziest pro wrestling match you've ever been in that you can remember? Uh, craziest match, uh, done hardcore, not quite the death matches we, they have today where, where guys just get, uh, get torn up with, with light tubes and hitting each other with, with literally with fluorescent light tubes, uh, not wise on several levels. Uh, but you know, having been in, in some matches, uh, where I took unprotected headshots with a chair, uh, thinking back to those times where just the guy was swinging on me with a chair. It, that's not cool. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, we didn't know about concussions yeah. 20 years ago. Or we did and we chose to ignore it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a lot of the, we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah, we did. And we thought it would be cool as shit to get hit in the head with a chair. Mm. And you know what? It was. But <laughs> But, but it's going to come back to haunt me at some point, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, probably that kind of stuff is is, is the craziest. Um, the the most interesting was was in Brazil. Go you know going to that place. I've seen and, how passionate and, Brazilians are about their soccer. I can only imagine what happens when you mix pro wrestling in with that passion. So here's the interesting thing. Uh, I would think that very same thing. I, I, I think pro wrestling should be incredibly popular in Brazil based on what I know about their culture. And, and, and admittedly, I don't know very much. You can't. Mm -hmm. As an as a, as a outsider gringo, you're not going to know any. And gringo is basically anybody who's not Brazilian. Um, but I've tried to, to learn some things. And, and if you look at uh, you know, the pageantry of Carnival and you look at uh, even, even the, the fighting history – um, and, and you look at dancing and, and music, you look at all these things, you think, gosh, pro wrestling could really fit in here. Like this could be really interesting, but unfortunately that's not the, they didn't play out that way. Really? And, and so the audience I worked, I, I worked in front of, uh, was, was relatively small. Uh, they were into it, but it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't like this voraciousness. The funny thing is I was saying derogatory things to them in Portuguese <sighs> So they thought I was Brazilian pretending to be American. Okay. So I should have insulted them in English, 
I was just, I wanted to make sure they understood my insults. You, <laughs> you know? were Chael Sonnen before his time, just in the wrong language. It, exactly. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's multifactorial. Yeah. Um, I, I still think he, he is probably the greatest trash talker in MMA. Uh, although I'd have to, I'd have to, he'd have to share the title of greatest heel with Brock Lesnar, I think. Oh yeah. Well, pro, he was a heel because he was a pro wrestler. Like yeah. that just... You know, again, we, we and then he played it to wrestling. the absolute hilt. Yeah, because he's a pro wrestler and knows how to sell pay per views. Yeah. You know, I mean, and Chel Sonnen knows how to talk himself into a fight, where or maybe you know, based on rank and 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 other yeah. things, it shouldn't have been in some of the fights in his later career. But he he talked himself into it. People wanted to see it. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. That's business. That's and that, it, you know, people don't purists don't like that. But where would you rank Conor McGregor on that? scale of uh I mean, heel versus being able to sell a fight versus performer uh, up there i mean maybe even top one i okay. mean and, and if you look at numbers i think that probably that probably uh makes sense these guys are these guys understand it and and any any of those people who would say that they don't they didn't get any influence from pro wrestling uh is is is, is not telling the truth yeah. but that's but of course they wouldn't, and that's the beauty of it. Mm. They they got their influence from pro wrestling, and and of course they're not going to tell the truth, you know. Danny Nasanto used to say that Muhammad, and back in the day when Muhammad Ali was fighting, there was a wrestler called Gorgeous George, mm-hmm. and it'd be very politically incorrect now, but basically he was a flaming homosexual. Without using that word, he would wear all kinds of poncy clothing and pink bathrobes and dust his opponent in perfume before touching him, and and he would do all these things to really want the audience to just to watch him die. Yep. And apparently, uh, Muhammad Ali would watch pro wrestling and he'd watch Gorgeous George and watch the others. He'd go, oh, that's good. That's what I should do. So it's funny to watch all these guys now going, man, Muhammad Ali is the best. When Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay was the total heel. And so many mm-hmm. people just wanted to see him get his, you know, arrogant black face smashed in because in that era if you were a black man and you had a mouth on you basically most of the people didn't think that that was cool so that's what i mean like understanding the audience and and taking them on the ride that that they want to go on is 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 pro wrestling so and and those things absolutely play out in in mma at least in terms of the promotion of the fight you know and then and then the rule set makes the fight as exciting as as possible while still being uh, real. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all learned though, from, from that pro wrestling, uh, the background. So how do people follow you? And I guess I got to ask, how do people follow you in both worlds, <laughs> in your consulting world and in your pro wrestling world, in your pro wrestling world, you are Tad wrestler. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Tad, Tad is my actual first name and there, it's a long story. Uh, Fideus, just, there was a point it... in, in, what is it a contraction of something else no that's that's actually just my first name just tad okay yep but there when i came up there was this kind of movement to be yourself and like wrestling is real and 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 the world is a work was is kind of this way of, of looking at things and and honestly i think we we the the people that i that i was hanging out with uh but definitely i felt this way um i i could be more myself in mm. in pro wrestling than i could in out out in the real world doing my my shoot job. Um, and so I, I, I wrestled as, as Tad and I've just always stuck with that. I became Lincoln Murphy because Lincoln's my middle name and I wanted to hide from my wrestling past. Okay. Um, I've since come to terms, obviously. <laughs> so you can follow me at Tad Wrestler on Instagram uh, or, or Facebook and, and see the nonsense I post. Um, you can follow me at Lincoln Murphy on, on Twitter and Instagram if you want my customer success. Uh, stuff. But, uh, you know, the main thing was I wanted to just kind of fill in some gaps here and, you know, about catch and, 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 uh, how, it, how it influenced things in, in Brazil and, and, and Japan. And I, I think we touched on a few of those things. So yeah, I, uh, we could have gone a lot, a lot deeper. We should probably do a deep dive on, on just one topic, you know, about catch wrestling in Japan. That, that's something that yeah. I'd love to learn more about. I've, I've dove into it a bunch of times, but, uh, why don't we uh, agree to do that and nothing but that in the future? That'd okay, be amazing. Perfect. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Well, 
have a, thank you so much for coming on, Lincoln. I hope people uh-huh. follow you. I wish you best of luck in your consulting career and in your uh, your wrestling career. And uh, awesome. I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Absolutely. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.